Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, we know it's a really busy time of year, so we're especially appreciative of you being here. Okay, so hello and welcome back to Patton's book study series with the writing group Rope with the amazing Joan Sedita. We're so thrilled to have you back here this evening once again. Uh, this session is kind of like the makeup session for November 30th. So we're going to go back to chapters five, uh, critical thinking stages of the writing process, and chapter six, uh, syntax. My name is Dr. Pam Kastner, and I have the honor of serving as patent state lead for literacy. And joining from the patent literacy team tonight is our Western Regional Literacy Lead, Jeannie Hertzler. She's going to give you a little wave there. Um, before we get started, I know last week um, there were some issues with the form link for Act 48, and we've had some questions about that. So I just want to put everyone's mind at ease that my amazing program assistant, Kelly Cap was able to use the Zoom participant report to determine the attendees and each person on the Zoom report, if of course you named yourself, um, your first name and your last name as you did when you registered, has been marked as attended and certificates of attendance are ready now, but please allow until early January for your Act 48 hours to appear in PERMS records. And towards the end of our session tonight, I'll put the information there uh, in the chat as to how you can um, access those certificates. Okay. Um, also, please, just a reminder, I see some thank yous here. I'm happy to do that for you. Um, it is important if you're attending uh, and you are seeking Act 48 credit that your first name and last name or how the name you registered with is really important. If it just says iPhone or Pam's iPhone, um, then Kelly won't know which Pam or what person that is. So it's very important, please, to have your first name and last name or your registered name um, in uh, the chat there or as, as recorded for you. If you um, have a different name, just go up to the right-hand corner where those three little dots are, and then you can just click that down and you'll see a, uh, an area where it says rename, and that's where you can rename yourself. Okay, all right. And um, now uh, Jeannie's going to introduce for the very last time, um, Joan Sedita to everyone, and then we'll get started for the evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's my honor to introduce Joan Sedita. Joan is the founder of Keys to Literacy, a literacy professional development organization. She has been in the literacy field for over 40 years as a teacher, administrator, and a teacher trainer. She has authored multiple literacy professional development programs, including the Key to Comprehension Routine, the Key Vocabulary Routine, Keys to Beginning Reading, Keys to Content Writing, Keys to Early Writing, Understanding Dyslexia, and Adolescent Literacy. Beginning in 1975, she worked for 23 years at the Landmark School, a pioneer in the development of literacy intervention programs. As a teacher, principal, and director of the outreach teacher training program at Landmark, Joan developed expertise, methods, and instructional programs that address the literacy needs of students in grades K through 12. Joan was one of the three lead trainers in Massachusetts for the Reading First program and was a letters author and trainer. Joan received her master's in reading from Harvard University and her bachelor's from Boston College. Thank you so much for being with us, Joan. Thank you, uh, Jean, Jeannie, and thank you, Pam, and everybody at uh, Patan. You guys have been so great um, each, each week sharing the questions and watching the chat box for me. I, I really appreciate it. And welcome back to those of you who have been to at least one of the other ones that we've done. And uh, to those of you that this might be your first one, uh, welcome for the first time. And as they noted, um, <clears throat> this is a makeup for the uh, session I missed on November 30th when I was sick and I did not have a voice. Uh, so we are going back now and doing some of the middle chapters, chapter five and chapter six. Um, as I've shown at the start of each one of these, I just wanted to point out a few things. Uh, some technical things. Those of you who have the book, um, you know, I love the colors and, and stuff that the, that the Brooks folks did. If you uh, turn into the first couple pages, there's a box, a code, a box that looks like this. By the way, the second letter is a small L, not a capital I. 
Uh, and if you use this and follow their directions, it will bring you to the Brooks Publishing Electronic Resources site where they have um, stored many of the templates and handouts um, and checklists that are part of the book. They've got them there in electronic uh, format so that you can download them instead of photocopying some of the pages that are designed for people to copy. And then finally, and this will be running out, I believe at the very end of December, if you haven't purchased the book and want to, if you do this from the pro books publishing website um, and you use this code, Sedita, S-O-R, uh, they will give you 10% off and free shipping. So uh, as I said, we're going to begin with chapter five, which is tied to the part of the writing rope, the critical thinking, the strand, the one up at the top. Now, for those of you who were with us last week, when we did um, chapters, the, the, a couple of the later chapters, we were doing chapters from the critical re, uh, thinking strand that to, had to do with teaching, summarizing, and then teaching students the skills they need to write about sources, right, or writing about reading. And that was very much tied to the first bullet that you see up here under the critical thinking strand. <clears throat> Today, in chapter five, tonight in chapter five, we're going to focus um, on another part of this strand, and that has to do with the stages of the writing process. That's chapter five. Chapter six, we'll be moving into the syntax strand. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the stages of the writing process. Um, this has been studied for quite some time. A pair of uh, researchers named Hayes and Flowers uh, back in the 1960s were the uh, one of the first pairs of research to, researchers to try to look at what stages do um, effective writers go through. And their thinking was, if we can identify the processes or stages that and make them them obvious, right, that then we could teach those stages to budding riser, re, writers and kind of teach them the process. So uh, you can go back to the, gosh, the 1960s and see research about this. They started with four stages over time. They changed it to five. Um, a lot of other researchers have done work on this. And so there are lots of different ways of saying the, the stages, different names for them. If you look at the common core standards, for example, there's a whole writing standard devoted to the stages of the writing process. Um, what, what I found along with my colleagues at Keys to Literacy was that oftentimes, um, like kids just don't think about the stages, right? It, like they just pick up the pencil or, or they start typing in something and they go right to the right stage and they very often skip the revised stage. So we, we came up with a little acronym to kind of help kids remember to do all the stages. And we call it the process writing routine. You can, in the book, it's in figure 5.1, and you would find that on page 46. And by the way, as a reminder, if you see a page number in the bottom right of a slide, that's letting you know where in the book we, we are aligned. And so basically, if you take the first letter of the title, T-P-W-R, that represents the stages. So T is for think, P is for plan, W is for write, and R is for revise. Uh, you can see on figure 5.1, the sub steps that are under each phase. So under think, we're talking about, think about identifying who's your audience and purpose, right? We, we talked about that in an earlier chapter about how being aware of TAP is real, TAP, task audience purpose is so important because it helps you guide decisions you have to make about things when you're going to write, right? The tone that you're going to use, how long will the piece be? Um, think part of the thinking stage is you're going to brainstorm your topic um, if the teacher hasn't assigned one. This is where if you're writing related to anything that that um, is read, said, or done, so you're writing from a source, you're going to need to gather information. So that's where you're going to take some notes. Or let's say you're you're writing something that you're creating from scratch. You're creating a story, let's say. You still have to gather your ideas down in your notes so that you don't forget them, right? Um, so that's all associated with the thinking stage. 
The next is planning. So now you have all this information or these notes or these great ideas, right? And before we start writing, we want to come up with an organizational plan, a structure. And if you can use some sort of planning guide for that, right? A graphic organizer, an outline, right? That is going to make your written piece much, much more structured. One of the things we talked about in an earlier chapter was the three main types of writing. And we talked about how when we teach students the differences and similarities in the structures between informational and argument or opinion and narrative writing, that there are elements like an introduction, a conclusion, and then how the body is developed. And the body for each of those three types will be developed differently. And so if at the planning stage, you know you're gonna be doing um, an argument piece, let's say, you want to come up with a plan that's gonna map out your reasons. Maybe you have three reasons. Maybe you also have a counterclaim and then you have a rebuttal. So your graphic organizer should reflect that. If you're doing an informational piece, you wanna chunk your ideas and information into big topics and then subtopics that end up becoming paragraphs and sections, right? If you're doing a narrative, your plan should be, what's the order of the events that I'm going, going to use? Um, so the planning is very important. The right now, hopefully you've got a planning guide, a plan somehow on paper, right, that you saved. So you wanna make sure you follow that because I know a lot of students who they learn to use a graphic organizer and they hand it into the teacher and then they don't bother using it. So we wanna follow our plan, but at the right stage, this is where we wanna translate those ideas and that information into sentences and then group the sentences to become paragraphs. Now, the work we're gonna review in the next chapter about syntax, sentence writing, is really important because as we've said in a lot of the chapters, if students can't write a good sentence, their writing is gonna be affected. So this is where all the skills and practice that you've done with them for how to write good sentences, how to elaborate sentences, how to combine sentences, this is where they, they, they put it to the test. Um, it's also where we talked about paragraph structure in a previous chapter. This is where that time you spend teaching them what is a paragraph. Every time you have a main idea, you wanna start a new paragraph. How do you write a topic sentence? How do you use transitions to make the ideas flow within the paragraph? They're really gonna tap into those skills. All right, the last stage is revision. And we like to break this out into two substages. First is you wanna revise your piece for what you have to say, for the content. Did you cover everything you wanted? Is it clear? Um, is the order, does it make sense? Did you follow a plan or can you, can you reorganize it to make it better? Whereas the second stage of the revision is more what people refer to as editing or proofreading. This is where you're going to check your spelling, right? You're going to check your punctuation. Um, so those are the, the four stages. Uh, it's really helpful for kids if you can keep some sort of anchor chart or a poster in front of them. You can certainly take the figure that's on 5.5. And if you use the Brooks Electronic Hub, hub site, right? You can download this and then just make it into a poster, right? Or copy it for kids, put it in a plastic sheet protector. But one of the things that you see on this slide, this is something from uh, my keys to content writing training. We have these posters that have the process writing routine. And, uh, you know, anytime we are training teachers and they end up with one of the training manuals, they get a copy of this poster. I'm not saying this to like, say buy the poster because you can make your own poster, right? All you need is some markers. But the idea is this is hanging up on a wall so that as kids are doing any kind of writing, you can say to them, let's not skip the thinking and the planning stage. All right, you'll notice there's an arrow on both of these. And um, I, I wanna talk about why we have that. It's there to remind students that even though there are stages, and you, so you like to think about them going as first you think, then you plan, then you write, then you revise. In reality, all good writers cycle through those stages multiple times. So you might've done some great thinking and gathered some notes. 
And then you start to put it into your graphic organizer to develop a plan. And you realize that maybe you're writing about three things and you realize that the third thing, you don't have enough information. So what do you do? You go back to the thinking stage. Or maybe you're now starting to write and you're writing out your sentences and your paragraphs and you realize that, again, you need some more information. So you go back to the think stage. Or you begin to realize that what you thought would be a good plan isn't turning out to be. So you go back to the plan stage and you readjust there. And then certainly at the revision stage, you might find all kinds of things that you want to update and change, which could bring you back to earlier stages. So it is what we call a recursive uh, process. Uh, also, I'll come back to the slide for a second. Let's look at the little gray box. Research supports explicit instruction of the writing process. Now, in the first chapter of this book, and we addressed this in our first meeting, I did a review of what, what does the research say about most effective ways to teach writing. Uh, I brought your attention to several big reports that are based on meta-analyses of research. And over and over again, what, what many of these studies find is that if we teach students that writing is a series of stages in a process and that they're all important and you should never forget any of them or skip one of them, we find that that ends up improving their, rice, their writing. Okay, so let's talk about some resources that I put in the book for you. If you turn to page 47, you'll see another figure, figure 5.2. And um, what I've done here is for each stage of the writing process, we've given some questions that you can pose students to help remind them of what they could and should do at each stage, right? So for example, at the think stage, the first question is, what is the writing task, the purpose, and the audience for your writing piece? So let's cue them right up front to think about that. Or let's look at the first question and, and brainstorm the topic. What do I already know about this topic? What sources might I use to learn more about this topic? Or we could look under gathering information. This is all still under the think stage, right? Uh, what strategies should I use to understand the sources? Should I annotate the text? Should I use highlighting? So what you see on the slide are the questions for the first two stages. And then uh, this is a two page handout. So the rest of the questions are there. Um, why don't you take a moment just now and, and start to look at some of these questions and decide, do you think by giving kids all of these questions, it would be too overwhelming? If so, maybe just give them one or two for each stage of the writing process. But I like to think about these as scaffolds that help those students focus on a particular stage. All right. So as we've been doing throughout the book study, I've been calling your attention to the little, the little um, icon that Brooks Publishing put and all the places throughout the book where I asked them to please put these connect to the classroom. These are either questions I pose or suggestions for a lesson you might do. And my goal with this is to help you connect what you're learning in the book with what's happening in your classroom. Because, you know, all the research in the world or all the great ideas that you might pull out of this book and say, that's a great idea, or that's something I already do, but it really reinforces this, right? If we don't go back and use this, it's not going to help. And so that's the idea that connect to the classroom. I sometimes use a metaphor more often when I'm out actually training people, but like when you're, when you're training teachers, it's like you're in the room with them and you're throwing some jello up on the wall, right? And um, everybody's like tasting the jello and looking at the jello. And we all say, that's the most delicious jello I've ever seen. I'm going to start making that jello for my students, right? And, and what happens is when we finish the day of training and we walk out the door, the jello starts to slide down the wall, right? And very often teachers get busy, they move on to the next thing in their lives, right? And, they, and they're busy preparing for this or doing grading. And that jello that they said they're going to serve their kids all the time, they forget about it and they forget the recipe. So that's kind of what Connect to the Classroom is meant to do. So what I hope you would do is um, develop some kind of a lesson plan for how you could introduce the stages of the writing process. If you want to use my little 
you know, gimmick for remindering it, TPWR, great. If you, if you have a different terminology you want to use, that's fine. But I think we need to make sure that kids know what those stages are. All right. The next thing I do throughout this chapter is for each of the stages, I introduce at least one major instructional tool, right? That is really useful for that stage of the writing process. And what I do is not only do I show you the tool, but then I give you a very simple example. And the example is, let's say the writing task was to write about the four seasons in the year, okay? So we walk you through at the think stage, we introduce two column notes. Now, those of you who were in my session last week, you saw how we used two column notes for the writing from sources. And we showed lots of examples of gathering information from a text or maybe a video that we're watching where we put the big ideas on the left side of the note and the important details on the right. So this is a great tool for helping at the think stage. Because there's a lot of ideas that we either brainstorm or that's in our creative brains, right? Or that we're getting from sources and we can't hold it all in our heads. So we need a tool that's going to do that. And that's the two column notes. Um, so as we do in the chapter, what I'm going to do is show you. So how might we use two column notes as a tool for the thinking about what we're going to write for this imaginary task about the four seasons? And so here you see down the left are the four different seasons. One of the things we might talk about for each season is what kind of weather we have. What happens with trees during that, that, that season, right? Uh, what kinds of things do we tend to wear? And then maybe we might focus on what's a, a really well-known sport that's played in that season. Now, I'm using a very simple example here because what I want you to focus on is the tool. And that's how you can introduce these tools to students. Have them write about something they're very familiar with so that they're not at the same time trying to learn to use two column notes, also trying to process really complicated information. So that's uh, the tool I want you to kind of take away for the think stage. Now let's talk about the planning stage. And I actually intro introduced this to you in a, an earlier session and in a later module when we were talking about um, the three types of writing, right? And uh, I, I shared a slide. We talked about how a, a common planning tool is something called the five paragraph essay format, right? You see lots of graphic organizers. First paragraph intro, last paragraph conclusion, three paragraphs in the middle of your body, right? It's not a bad tool, right? It's kind of, it's helpful. The problem is everything we write isn't gonna be always a perfect five paragraphs. What if you only need one paragraph for the body or eight paragraphs for the body, right? But the concept of making kids aware of the structural elements, which really are introduction, conclusion, and then your body development, that we do want to remind kids of. So we use something called a top-down topic web. And if you're using one as a planning tool, for informational opinion or argument writing, the one you see on the top of the slide is your default top-down web. So the kids always start with intro body conclusion. Now, when once you've gathered the ideas you have and they're stored in the notes, and that's gonna be the big ideas as well as all the details, that's when you can start to plan out your body. So maybe you know, for example, that your body is going to have um, four main ideas, right? or maybe it's gonna have two reasons and one counterclaim and one rebuttal. So that's how you build out these topic webs. And I'm gonna show you an example using the, the tree assignment. If it's narrative writing, uh, the topic web that's a little bit better that lends itself more to narrative is beginning, middle, end. So that the beginning, that's where you introduce the reader to maybe your character or the first person, right? Or maybe the setting, maybe the first event that happens in the story. The end is the sort of the conclusion. It's where if there was a problem, you show the solution. And what's the body? The middle is going to be building out all the events in order. So if we were to do this for our simple writing about the seasons task, what would we put in our introduction? Well, 
you learned in a previous chapter that a good introduction for informational text at the very least has to tell the reader what you're writing about. So this is where we're going to have a sentence that's going to say something about the four seasons, right? If we were writing an argument piece, we would also make sure we state our claim here. We also learned that a conclusion, its main goal is to provide some closure. So we might, because the body is built around the kind of weather, right? The uh, clothing, the, the sports. So we might within our conclusion, conclusion have some sort of summary statement that just sums up that for each one of the seasons, these are the, these are the subtopics that we covered. Now our body, we're not gonna put a lot of detail. That's where your notes are for. This is to just remind you of the big picture. So in this case, if we decide that we're gonna kick off with winter, then that's gonna be our first topic. Then we're gonna be following it with spring and summer and fall. Maybe another student would start with spring, right? So you're just mapping out what are your topics. All right, um, so now let's move to the write stage. What's one of the twos? There's a lot about writing, teaching kids how to write sentences, how to write paragraphs, how to use transitions. There's a lot, right? But for thinking about this as a stage in the writing process, what's a tool or a scaffold? So we had two column notes for thinking and getting information. We had top-down webs for planning the structure. And now a really helpful tool or scaffold is a writing template. If you were here when we reviewed some of the, the information in the paragraph chapter, you saw that I give you a whole collection of writing templates, one for each type of paragraph, description, sequence, cause and effect, right? Um, I also showed you some templates that are in the chapter about the three types of writing that are longer templates that students use as a scaffold to sort of fill the information in. So if I were gonna provide a writing template for our four seasons writing task, it might look like this. So I have space for the introduction. My body is going to have four main paragraphs, so I've got space for each. I kick it off with a spot for the topic sentence, and you might notice that the first one, I actually give a sentence starter. So it says the first season, and then the students will fill that out, and it's gonna be about winter, right? The second one, the second season. Paragraph three, another season. And then when we get to our fourth one, finally, right? Then there's space for the students to develop their supporting sentences and a space for them to put their conclusion. <clears throat> um, all right, so now the revised step, uh, one of the things I've done as a scaffold or a tool to help students at this stage is I've given you a set of guiding questions. This you'll see on figure 5.10 on page 55. So remember, there's two levels that happen at the, at the revised stage, revising your content and organization, like what you had to say, and then proofreading to fix the conventions. And so these guiding questions that you see are very much aligned to help the students make sure they're thinking about everything they need to at the revised stage. So at the very end of this chapter, um, I then give you an example of, so we had notes, we saw a top-down web, I showed you a template that could be used as a scaffold. So now let's take a look at what might happen at the revised stage. This example in the book shows up at the top, the first draft that the student wrote. And you can see everything is there, right? We have a topic sentence, every year has four seasons. Look, you can see the student borrowed the, that wording that I gave them on the template, right? They um, brought in the key information, that was in the top in the two column notes, but it's kind of, I mean, it's just a first draft. We want to make it better. So let's look at what the student did to make it better. And the example in the book literally spells out for you. So one of the first things you might say to students is, how about we add some more transitions so that our sentences flow from one to the other and our paragraphs flow to one another. And so you can see the students added some transitions. How about we revise our sentences? First of all, let's add a little bit more. Let's elaborate on this intro or let's elaborate on our concluding sentence. Also, 
if you look at the first draft, the sentences are all short, right? Very kind of short, stinted, right? Um, what do we learn? Or, or we'll go over it in a minute when we get to the chapter on syntax and elaborating sentences. But if we've taught students how to combine simple sentences into longer, more complex sentences, or if we've taught students how to take a very basic kernel sentence and by using several things that I'll share with you in a, in a little bit, we teach them how to elaborate that sentence. Well, that's what they want to do at the revised days. They want their sentences to be better. Um, and you can see the examples of how simple sentences up here were elaborated. They've been uh, 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 um, underlined. And then some examples of where they've been um, combined. So that basically walks you through not only the stages of the writing process, but we try in this chapter to give you one basic tool or scaffold for each stage of the writing process. Um, in the Connect to Classroom, the question posed to you, uh, you were asked to develop various lessons throughout that would try two column notes or introduce kids to the topic web or try a template with them. And the final question for you in our book study is, did you have a chance to do this? Have you tried any of these? Um, I know each week when I say to folks, please type into chat if you've tried this or your thoughts or how your students have reacted. And I know I know it's hard because I kind of move on to the next thing, but um, I really want to encourage any of you <clears throat> who tried using any of this uh, with your students already, please make a note in the chat so we can get a sense of how that went for you. All right, so now we're going to shift gears and delve into chapter six, which is the sentence uh, syntax and sentence skills chapter. It has a spot on the writing rope, the second one down. It's really about developing a sense of grammar, which is what syntactic awareness is, right? An awareness of the rules that govern the word order in a particular language. Um, it's also where we teach skill, skills and strategies to help kids write better sentences, to elaborate their sentences, to make them more complex. And in the process of doing that, we actually are also teaching them some very basic punctuation. So that's what this chapter is about. Um, I've used, explained this metaphor before, I think when we were talking about paragraphs in, a, in a, another session, which is in, in another chapter. Um, and I use this example of Legos. Um, if, if, if myself or the keys literacy trainers are out training teachers, sometimes we actually like to bring Lego blocks to make it this really multi-sensory for, for even the adults. So I want you to imagine that those little, the small blocks that you get, the, like the blue one on the left, represents a word, right? How do we build a sentence? Well, we add two, three. In the last, the last column, you see five words that are put together. That's a very short, simple five word sentence. Now, if we elaborate the sentence and we make it longer, that stack is gonna get big, bigger and bigger, but all it is is a bunch of words put together. Now, we have to be careful of the order we put them in. So for example, in English, we put our adjectives in front of our nouns. If I were to say the flat brown table, that sounds right to our, our syntactic awareness ear. If I were to say the table flat brown, does that sound right? No, because again, we put our adjectives in front of our nouns. However, if this was a romance language where adjectives get placed after nouns, then that would be syntactically correct. So it's the building blocks. The sentences are the building blocks of writing. Actually, the words are, but once you put a few of them together into a sentence, that's the start of writing. What do we do to make a paragraph? Well, we take several sentences and we put them together. We want to make sure they're all related to the main idea, right? We talked about that when we were discussing paragraph. Now, what if we put those like four or five or six of those lined up next to each other? How do we hold them together? Well, you know how in Legos, they have those like big longer pieces that have a lot of dots in them. Well, what if we had four or five of, the, of those, those stacks and across the top, we put one and we pressed on it. And what did it do? It holds them all together. That's like the topic sentence of the paragraph. And if we took another one and we put it on the bottom and we held them together there, that really tightens up our paragraph. So that's what I mean about being the building blocks. 
let's take the metaphor a little further. What if we're now going to write a four or five paragraph article? Well, now we've got paragraphs, these like chunks. We put them all together. And what do we do? We put an even bigger Lego block holding them together and on the bottom. And guess what that is? That's the introduction to our article and the conclusion to our article. And they're all held together. But if you look at it, what I literally did is I built a piece of writing block by block, sentence by sentence, and paragraph by paragraph. We could take it further. Let's say I'm writing an entire eighth grade science textbook. All I do is take those building basic blocks, I bring in a whole lot more of them, and now I'm going to chunk them on an even bigger level. I'm going to chunk a whole bunch of sections into a chapter and a whole bunch of chapters into a whole book. And I think we have to get kids to understand that that's how we write. You know, they, they, they look at writing as this overwhelming thing. They look at a book or they look at a three-page article and they're like, I could never do that. Well, guess what? You just wrote a paragraph and that's the building block. All you have to do is write a whole bunch more of them and stick them together, right? So that's why that, that, that notion of building comes into play. All right, so let's focus a little bit about sentence structure. And like many of the things that are in this book that I've been sharing with you, there's a yin and a yang to this, right? It's like I made this, this connection before too. If you're talking about phonics, there's phonics for decoding and there's phonics for encoding, right? Reading the words, spelling the words. Well, a lot of what you deal with with any of the text structures not only helps students write well-structured sentences and paragraphs, right? But it supports their comprehension. Because if you do any of the activities I'm gonna start sharing with you, they are gonna build syntactic knowledge and understanding and a, a, an ease with sentences and how to play with sentences. And certainly it's gonna make your sentence writing better, but it's also gonna make your comprehension easier. So if kids have difficulty comprehending long sentences, they're definitely gonna have difficulty writing them. Syntax, what does that mean? A little bit more about that. As I said with the building blocks, one by block one, the sentences, whether we speak them or write them, they communicate ideas that add up to overall meaning. So we want to encourage students when we're doing sentence work to think about what will make each and every sentence strong. I already explained what's on the bottom of the slide, what syntactic awareness is. So uh, this is a little quote from Bruce Sadler, who um, has, I think, written one of the best books there are out there. Um, I make reference to it in, in the chapter uh, about how you teach sentence writing. So I love this quote that Bruce wrote, of the many difficulties writers encounter when engaged in the complex act of writing, crafting sentences that accurately convey the intended meaning is particularly challenging. And manipulating sentences, and I would say the words in sentences, is both effortful, effortful, but also critical. So when we are teaching students about sentences, we should have two goals. Number one, develop their fluency for writing sentences so they can focus on the overall composing and structure. And then the second goal is to not only help them easily write sentences, but to help them write longer, elaborated, more complex. And for some of those students, they're gonna do this at the right stage, the first draft. Others who have weaker writing skills might have to, like you saw in that writing about the seasons example, they might have to get their ideas out on paper in short, simple sentences, but then it's in the revision stage that they begin to combine the sentences. So what are some of the things that teachers need to know? Uh, I get into this in a lot more depth in the book, but figure 6.1 is almost like a basic review of grammar. Now, I'm not a really big fan of, to me, it's not really important if kids can label parts of speech, right? Um, or that you, you can give me the definition of a dependent clause versus an independent clause, right? Or what's a coordinating conjunction? Like all those words can get overwhelming, right? But I think teachers do have to have a sense of some of these basic concepts, because once we start expanding our sentences, we are going to use some of this terminology. So that's why I say the teacher needs to know, 
And we've got a section in the book for you about that. So what are some activities that we can do? And I'm gonna walk you quickly through some of the simplest to the more complex. So at the very most basic level, and certainly students in third grade, second, third grade, this is what a core of their writing is gonna about, about sentences. We have to teach them about the two basic parts of a sentence, right? The subject and the predicate, the who, and then what's the who doing? Um, but I know some seventh, eighth graders, even high school students who don't get this. So you might have to go all the way back to some of this basic stuff. So what's one uh, or two activities we can do to help kids make sure they're writing full sentences? Card parts. So if you have some card, now in the case, the first example, it's simpler. We have a card part that's the subject, sea turtles. And then we have two possible predicates. Put the first one to the first one. Sea turtles is about loggerheads. Sea turtles travel thousands of miles. Which one sounds grammatically better to your ear? The second one, because the sea turtles are doing something. Now you can make it much more difficult by then giving students multiple subjects, multiple predicates, and now they have to switch them around and see how many sentences they can come up with always making sure that they have a naming part and an action part. Another thing we could do is give students one part or the other, give them a subject, they have to create the predicate, give them a predicate, they have to create the subject, right? And remember, this is gonna be a comprehension assessment as well as an assessment of sentence construction. If we ask them to do these activities, writing about something we're teaching them in science or in history, or maybe something in the novel that we're reading. Uh, how about this, sorting activities? Which ones are fragments? Which ones are full sentences? If it's a fragment, you have to complete the full sentence. So claws and beaks, that's a fragment. Snaps her beak, that's a fragment. So what can you do to build that sentence out? All right, now what we're gonna switch gears to are three activities that help develop syntactic awareness and sentence elaboration, right? And what all of these do is they provide opportunities for kids to practice manipulating parts of the sentence. Let's take the first one, sentence scrambles. What are they? So this is you give students a set of words that make up a sentence, but they're out of order. They're scrambled. And what they have to do is rearrange them into a grammatically correct sentence. The rules are you can't add words, you can't delete words. Start doing this with short sentences, maybe five words, then gradually increase it. If you wanna scaffold this to, to students, whatever the first word is and wherever it is in, in your scramble, give it a capital so they know to start. And then whatever the last word is, give them a punctuation as part of it, that helps scaffold it. So if we were to do some examples, and by the way, these are examples are pulled right out of the text that students were using in middle school um, textbooks. So why not practice the sentence work, having them remember some facts that they're learning in the content area. Now, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna give you the responses, but I know if I gave you a couple of minutes, you eventually would, would figure out and unscramble these sentences. By the way, another scaffold is, instead of just having them out laid out like this on a, on a piece of paper, put each word on a card so that the students can literally shuffle and move the cards around. And then they say the sentence out loud to themselves and they say, that doesn't sound right. I need to move this over there. So the first one is the water cycle is driven by the sun's energy. Colonial soldiers wore clothing that camouflaged them. And then we're getting longer here, right? In an isosceles trapezoid, both pairs of base angles are di and diagonals are congruent. So that's sentence scrambles. You can, think, can see how you could, if you could just do one or two of this as kids are walking in the room, getting settled, if every teacher did that once a week, think about all the practice they would get. All right, let's talk about sentence combining. This is one of the most researched activity that we have known this since the 1960s. When I was getting my master's in 79, 80, uh, in my reading comp class, I decided I, I really, I, we knew that it was well-researched to improve writing, but I also thought it would improve comprehension. There wasn't a whole lot of research, but whatever it was, I found it. I kind of made the case 
Since then, we've got tons of research that show this also supports comprehension. Um, so how does it work? Easiest way, I'm gonna show you examples. Two very short, simple sentences. Can you please combine them into one sentence? And again, for time, I'm just gonna go through these. The book and the movie were good or the movie and the book were good. What about this? The girl drank lemonade, the girl was thirsty. We might say the thirsty girl drank lemonade or we might say the girl drank lemonade because she was thirsty. With this, you can add words, you can move words around. The idea is to come up with a longer, more elaborated sentence or the weather was perfect, the girls were playing soccer, so on and so forth. You begin with simple examples, but here's where you can go with this. So here we've got, and, and where did I get this from? I started with one really long, complex sentence that was in a science textbook. The students were learning about lands, right? And I broke it down into shorter, simple sentences. And now the students have to bring them back together again. So we don't have time for you to do this now, but I guarantee if you had about three minutes, you'd be able to come up with a sentence. It might sound something like this. Wild lands are public and private lands that support native ecosystems and include landscapes such as rangeland and timberland. There's lots of ways to combine it, but you get the sense. All right, so when you are doing sentence combining with students, um, and, and all of this is explained in much greater detail in this chapter in the book, right? You want kids to have collaborative discussion. We, we reviewed in an earlier chapter that one of the really important teaching principles that we highlight in the beginning of the book is find opportunities for students to collaborate at all stages of the writing process. If students can work together with a partner or maybe in a group of three, and they do those sentence scrambles together, or you give them those sentences and you say, combine them. Now what happens is they start talking to each other and they say, well, no, 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 that's, that, that's a noun that needs to go over here. That's a descriptor that needs to go in front of it. No, that, and they all start reading the sentences out loud to each other. And what is it doing? It's building syntactic awareness. When the students are doing these and they're done, you say, what process did you use to combine that sentence? Which combination sounded best? Why did you think that was the best one? Which one seems to be the clearest? A couple of other tips about this. If we do this two to three times a week, if students practice this, it's gonna yield the best result. So it's better to do one five minute sentence combining activity once a week in a subject, and if kids did it in all five subjects, they do it five times that week, then spending a half hour once a month doing a lot of sentence combining, okay? Um, the way you do it, I said, grab something that the kids are already learning about, break it into shorter, simple sentences. Um, this can be done in any subject, not just the literacy block. More sentences. Explain to students why you're having them do it. What is this, what is this gonna get them to do in the end? They're gonna write longer, better sentences. Always start simple, two short sentences, work your way up. You can also reverse the process. Give them a longer sentence and say, can you break this into two or three sentences? We can also give cues. So one thing we might do is let's look at the two samples, the two sentences to be combined. So what we do is we give a hint by underlining the words that need to remain in the combined sentence. So if the sentence combined was the water cycle is, that is from both sentences, but we have to make sure that we include complex process and driven by the sun's energy, because if we don't, we're missing one of our combined sentences. The other thing we can do is give a scaffold by giving a connecting word, a coordinating conjunction. So we might say many new cars are electric, electric cars do not travel as far as gas powered. And we say, use the word, but it's gonna help you connect the two sentences. These are just scaffolds. Um, and then give lots of practice with cues. So we've got several things going on. We're underlining the combination of three sentences and we're also giving a conjunction. And then we see how all this combines together. Um, then you can practice without the cues. So here we've got, we're making it harder now. We've got four sentences and here's two possible ways to combine them. So I hope you get the sense of how this works. Um, 
Now, one of the things that I've given you in the book, and this is also in electronic downloads, is a real simple anchor chart to help kids with conjunctions, those connecting words, right? What are the basic kinds of punctuation you use in sentences? This is really helpful as an anchor chart to help remind students. Now, let's talk about two more ways to elaborate sentences that I have in this book. This one in particular is coming out of my keys to content writing. And that is use W questions. So you can see on the cards, who, what, why, where, when. We've also got a scaffold, when is, why, did, how, how can, right? And you give students these cards. So watch how it works. You give them a kernel sentence, the turtle, and you throw a question, who? That's the turtle. Did what? The turtle swims. Where did she swim? The turtle swims in the ocean. Which turtle? The young turtle swims in the ocean. And you can see how you build out the sentences and make them longer and longer through these W questions. Another one, this is a little more complex and I wanna give a shout out to my colleagues from Landmark School originally, Charlie Haynes and Terrell Jennings. Uh, this is an adaptation of their, their work. They call them expanding kernel sentences. And what you can see here are the steps. So you start with a kernel sen sentence, a noun and a verb, turtle swim, right? And then, the first thing you do is elaborate the subject by adding adjectives, then elaborate the predicate by adding adverbs. You could stop right there and you'd already have an expanded sentence, but then you could keep going. You add a phrase, then you can say to the students, compound the subject, compound the predicate. It's much easier if I show you an example. So turtle swims is our kernel. Can you elaborate it? The small green turtle swims. Can you elaborate the predicate? Small green turtle swims quickly. Let's add a where phrase. The small green turtle swims quickly into the seaweed. So we could stop there, but well, let's keep it going. Let's compound the subject. The turtle and his friend dive quickly into the seaweed. The small green turtle and his friend dive and swim quickly into the seaweed. Now let's add a dependent clause because he's frightened. And then let's combine two into a compound sentence. So look at this elaborated sentence. But if you were to say to the students, Make your sentence a little longer. They don't know how to begin. So it's explicit instruction with guided practice doing each of these stages that help kids eventually learn to do this on their own. So here's, I'll, I'll, uh, you don't have time to do this yourselves right now, but you might give students a picture, right? And you might say, I want you to create a kernel sentence. So maybe it's the dog watches. And now we're going to follow all those steps and build out our sentence, but because we've got the cues or clues of things going on in the picture, it helps kids develop out the sentence. All right, so uh, that brings us to, we have eight minutes left for, left for questions. Every week, I, I try to make sure we get a little bit more time. So while we take some questions here, um, I'm gonna keep showing this slide uh, because what it's got are the connections to a lot of the free resources that I have mentioned to you about over the weeks. My Literacy Lines blog, monthly I pick a topic, I develop it, I write about it. The last one I posted for December was uh, an answer to the question, what is systematic, structured, explicit instruction? Other months, like about a year or so ago, I did a two-part where I took a lot of the things that are in this chapter, how do you do sentence combining? So I take a topic every month, please visit the blog. And then there's this very large extensive collection of free resources that include archived webinars and templates and so on and so forth. All right, so let's see, somebody from Patan, do you wanna pose a question to me? Thanks, Joan. Yeah, we have a couple of comments because at one point you had asked folks to put some comments in the chat yes. stating um, how they've been utilizing your resources. So if I could just read a couple of those and then we do have a couple of questions. Is that okay? Wonderful. Yes. Okay. Um, Nicole shared that her student performance measure this year is on writing with her fourth grade multilingual learners. She has seen growth so far this year with implementing the two column notes and topic webs in all of their writing pieces. They've improved their thinking and planning process so they're able to write more independently than they could in September. Uh, they've been working on sentence elaboration and she can't wait to see how much they're going to grow uh, by the end of the year. That's excellent. That's great. Thank you so yeah. much. And I think she mentioned that she works with English language learners. Is that, is that correct? 
I believe. Yeah. And, yep. It and, was an acronym. Um, you know, look, this stuff helps everybody, but I think English language learners, this chapter about sentence and syntactic awareness, that that often is a challenge if the if the grammatical rules in their first language are a little bit different. And so a lot of that stuff around sentence combining and elaboration, I think is very useful for our English language learners. Yeah, what's another one? Thank you. Yeah, Karen shared that her co-taught third grade class created trifold research pamphlets on famous people for social studies. And she had them using scaffolding notes and recursive revisions to create their products. And she felt like they all came out very well. Excellent. Uh, Elise shared that when she co-taught in reading and ELA classes, they used the Cornell two-column note system, an overall diagram, and a template, as well as a checklist for editing. So it sounds like great. people are on the right track. That's great. You know, I said this when we talked about the templates in the last meeting, that um, while you're certainly welcome to use the ones I've given you, like especially the paragraph ones, or I have a longer template for an informational piece, what I want you to do is just look at all those templates and get the gist of how you make a template. Uh, I think we even gave it, I showed a template for a summary, right? Whatever your particular writing task is, create a writing template that's aligned to that task. You know, so if, if it has five paragraphs, have, have spots for five paragraphs, choose transitions that, that lend themselves to your writing task. So that's great. Um, all right. How about questions? Yep, there are a couple of questions. So the first one, um, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I don't have the name of this person, but they asked that in addition to a graphic organizer, would a word bank be considered an appropriate tool for use with new vocabulary when writing for words that are adding content versus words that they want students to use estimated spellings? Yes, word banks. Well, first, let's talk about this. You know how throughout I've, I've brought up the issue of transition words, right? And in the book, I give you a list of transitions by use. And I think I mentioned to you, I've been using that same list since 1978, right? Um, you know, that's a word bank. It's a very particular purpose. It's a word bank of transition words and phrases. Um, in, in I, I don't have it in this book, the, the Brooks book, but in our Keys to Early Writing, for example, which is geared for kindergarten to grade two teachers, we talk a lot about that, about word choice um, being part of writer, writing craft. And um, that if, if we're asking kids to elaborate their sentences, um, what we might need to do is give them lists of adjectives based on adjectives that are related to sound and sight and touch and taste, right? So that if you're saying to students, you know, let's take the, the example I use, the turtle swims. And we say, we say, describe the turtle. Well, you know, especially young ones, but I also think English language learners, they, they might not have as large a lexicons. So by providing word lists like that for them to choose from, that, that is going to uh, uh, let, enable them to do that or adjectives, right? Um, so yes, I absolutely think providing word lists can be very helpful. Um, and, and, and the transitions in particular. Thank you, Jen. This one was a question about explicitly teaching the order of adjectives. So how important do you feel it is to spend time on that order of adjectives? I know you were talking about syntax at one point. I think that's when this person had the question. Um, and particularly for students who don't have that intuitive syntactic ear. How do you, how would you advise? I, I guess I'm not exactly sure what they mean by the order of adjectives. I mean, do they mean that the adjectives should come in front of the noun? I, I think, think that's what they mean, yes. Okay, yeah. I think that's very important, but the way you're gonna teach it is not telling them in English the adjectives go in front of the nouns. That doesn't mean anything. The way you develop that, right, is by giving them, so you give them, remember, the movie was good, the book was good, right? So you might say, um, you know, there was a green turtle, you know, there was a purple turtle, you know, and in your combining, you could say there was there were green and purple turtles. And what are they doing while they're manipulating the words to combine the sentences? They're also practicing keeping the adjectives in front of the nouns. And every time they read that sentence back, they hear that order. The sentence scrambles in particular really help kids. And if you do it with cards, like I said, so that they lay them out and they read them through one time and that's not sounding right. Now, this is where the instruction comes in. 
So if they're doing that, and let's say they put that adjective after the noun instead, well, now you can say to the students, let's put it in front, read it in front, and then read it afterwards, which one sounds better. And Joan? that's, I think, how you do that. You're running out of time. So I was yeah. actually, I was asked to unmute because that wasn't actually the question. The question was not about that they come before the noun, that they, the order of like the flat brown table as opposed to the brown brown you know changing the order like because there are conventions that different kinds of adjectives yeah, that, that we naturally hear yeah I guess that 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 to me is getting um a little bit more in the purview of the English language art teacher um I don't think if a social studies teacher is going to do a quick sentence combining activity that you're going to have time to 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 get into that. That 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 that's my feeling. You're getting a little bit into the weeds there. Thank I'll you, Stacey, for clarifying. <laughs> I misunderstood your question. So, Joan, we have come to the end of time here. I just want to make sure everybody sees the exit code, and we did put the link to the Act 48 form in the chat, and that should be clickable for you if you need Act 48. Please remember, as Pam said, that your full name is displayed in your little video box on Zoom. Um, that's how Kelly Cap, our assistant, knows who attended. And if there are any questions then about Act 48, she can refer to that list. So please make sure your full name is on there. And I think Pam might have some closing comments. I, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, of course, first of all, to uh, Joan Sedita, we have been so honored and we're so grateful for all that she's taught us. I know I saw a lot in the chat um, talking about how much they've learned through all these sessions and how grateful they are. So I hope that you've had a chance to see those, Joan, um, and to everyone who attended, and of course, to the patent literacy team members.